you know, we often talk about all the great things that come with training employees, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. all the benefits. Right. But have you ever actually stopped and thought about what it costs not to train people? Yeah, it's something we don't think about enough, you know? I mean, we're always so quick to add up the cost of like courses and bringing in people to do workshops and all that, but we almost never really look at how much those untrained behaviors are costing us. Yeah. You know, draining resources and really just hurting the bottom line. And that's really what we want to unpack in this deep dive today. Yeah, let's get into it. So we've got some really interesting stuff here from Praxis Corporation. Okay. This was a consulting firm back in the 70s, and they had this system called a performance audit. And it was basically like this whole systematic way to figure out what was going on with performance in an organization and then, you know, trying to address those issues. I like it. Very systematic. Yeah. And one of the things that really struck me when I was going through Praxis's materials was this idea of these two different types of deficiencies. Okay. Knowledge deficiencies and execution deficiencies. Okay. So knowledge deficiency is pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. If you don't know it, you don't know it. Right. Exactly. But execution deficiency, that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Yeah. So break that down for us. What is an execution deficiency? So it's that gap that exists between knowing what you should be doing and then actually doing it. Okay. So think about like an employee, maybe they got all the training in the world on a software. Right. But they just can't seem to use it, right? That's an execution deficiency. Okay. They know what to do, but something's getting in the way. Something's stopping them from actually putting it all together. Yeah. And Praxis really got into a lot of cases, a lot of real world examples, and try to figure out what are those roadblocks. Yeah. What is it? And it really often came down to just not having those feedback mechanisms in place, <laughs> unclear expectations, or even accidentally discouraging the right behaviors. Right. It's like you get what you reinforce right. Exactly. If you're not out there encouraging the right things, you're naturally going to get some of these execution deficiencies. Exactly. And the cost of those little slip-ups, it can be huge. Like, yeah. Let's say statewide electric power company, okay. Praxis, yeah. they found that the engineers, they're these were smart people. They were submitting reports that weren't accurate and they weren't on time. And these reports were about... Oh, you know, yeah. project time costs, that sort of thing. So like basic administrative stuff. Right. You'd yeah. think, you know, just a little reminder, hey, get it in on time. Right. Do it right. Yeah. But here's the thing. They had no idea... Oh, no. ...that these reports were actually being used for like pricing proposals and like actually securing contracts. Oh, wow. So they, they didn't get it. They didn't know. Didn't understand the impact. So they were like messing up the company without even realizing it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, statewide was like losing bids and their budgets were all messed up. Wow. They were even getting into contracts that just did not make financial sense. And all because these reports weren't right. It all goes back to those reports yeah. and because nobody told them what was up. Wow. So it seems like a small thing, right? but it can really snowball. Totally. And you know what? This whole feedback thing, it comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. Praxis found another great example with Emory Air Freight. Okay, I've heard of them. So they were doing this whole containerization thing. Oh, yeah. Trying to, like, you know, pack more stuff in and save money on shipping. Exactly. It's super smart idea on paper. Yeah. But in reality, they were losing, like, $650,000 a year. No way. What went wrong with the containers? So it turned out the dock workers were only using the containers for like 45% of the shipments. Really? I wonder why. Did they ask them, like, why aren't you using the containers? They did. They actually looked into it. Okay. And it wasn't that people hated the containers or anything like that or that they didn't know how to use them. Okay. It was feedback again or I guess the lack of it. <laughs> what do you mean? The dock workers, they just didn't get how using the containers or not using them was affecting the company as a whole. So they're loading up these shipments every day. Right. But they don't see how that connects to, like, you know, Emory Air Freight making money or losing money. Yeah, exactly. Now, and to make matters worse. What? Nobody was telling them good job when they did use the containers. So they're saving the company money, but nobody's giving them a pat on the back. Nope. No system for it. Interesting. So how'd they fix it? Did they, like, bring in some hotshot consultant to tell them what to do? Not at all. They kept it super simple. What'd they do? They put up a scoreboard. A scoreboard. Right there on the dock so everybody could see it, and it showed how much everybody was using the container. Oh, so they made it a competition. Yeah, and you know what? It totally worked. Almost immediately, container usage went from 45% to 86%. Wow, just from putting up a scoreboard. And it kept going up, but the scoreboard, it was only part of it. Oh, really? 
What else did they do? They started giving positive reinforcement. Oh, nice. The managers were trained to tell the dock workers when they were doing a good job using the containers. Oh, that's great. I love that. It made them feel good about contributing, you know? Definitely. And the results speak for themselves. Yeah. Emery saved a ton of money, and the dock workers felt better about their jobs. It was a win-win. It's amazing what a difference a little thing like that can make. Right. It really shows what Praxis was talking about when they said sometimes the best answers are the simplest ones. Totally. But we've only talked about execution deficiencies, right? What about those times when people just don't know the stuff they need to know? Ah, uh, yes. The knowledge gap. Yeah. Did Praxis have a system for that, too? They did. They called it methodical progression. Metho what? Methodical progression. Okay. That sounds kind of complicated. It's not really. Think of it like building a house. You wouldn't start with the roof, right? Right. You need a good foundation first, and you got to build up from there step by step. Okay, so it's like a plan for how to train people the right way. Exactly. Praxis broke it down into five main parts. Five parts. Okay. We don't... So first you've got inductive. Inductive. That's all about getting people excited about learning, showing them why they should care. So like answering the question, what's in it for me? Exactly. Then you've got tools of learning. This is where you give them the basic information and skills they're going to need. So like the building blocks. Exactly. Like yeah. teaching them new words or showing them how to use a software, that kind of thing. Got it. Then there's theory, which is where you really get into the nitty gritty of how things work. So you go deeper than just the basics. Exactly. You're explaining the why behind the what. I like it. After that, it's time for skill development. Which is? Getting their hands dirty, actually trying things out oh fun so this could be anything from like role playing to working on real projects you know whatever helps them actually use what they're learning learning by doing exactly and then finally you have application right this is where they figure out how to use all this new stuff in their actual job putting it all together exactly. so this methodical progression thing it's not just some idea they had right Praxis actually used it with their clients. Oh, yeah. They used it all the time across all kinds of industries, from like manufacturing to healthcare, you name it. Wow. So it worked for different kinds of jobs, too. Oh, yeah. They even had this whole case study called Performance Inc. Mm -hmm. that showed how to use the whole process step by step. That's cool. I bet that was helpful for people. Super helpful. Mm. It's all about figuring out where the problems are, figuring out what's causing them, and then coming up with a plan to fix them. And sometimes the simplest fix is the best one. Right. right? Exactly. Like just giving someone a checklist or a better way to track their work can make a huge difference. You know. It's all about finding those little things that have a big impact. Well said. So as we wrap up here today, any final thoughts on the cost of untrained employees? I think the biggest takeaway is that even small changes can make a big difference. Like oh, we've yeah. been saying, a little bit of feedback, a little bit of praise, a well-placed job aid. Those things can really add up. They can make or break a business. Exactly. Praxis said it best. Small deficiencies in behavior can produce large deficiencies in accomplishment. So true. Well put. So we've got to pay attention to those little things, those little gaps in knowledge and execution. Yeah. Look for those little things that can make a big difference. You might be surprised what you can achieve. Great advice. I love it. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. But before we go, we want to leave you with something to think about. Yes. Where in your own work or maybe even in your personal life, could you use a little feedback or maybe give someone some praise or maybe just create a better system for getting things done? The possibilities are endless. They are. Until next time, get live and deep.